Before I go through the running order for tonight, I have a message for us from Jonathan Giraffe. <laughs> Yes. 
Testing. Testing. Those major things are overshadowed by the, the national embarrassment that is Brexit, which is actually something which threatens us to seriously diminish our standing in the world, do serious economic damage, and Lib Dems are talking in terms of 50 million over the lifetime of the next parliament, arguably that's a conservative estimate. That damage robs our ability to do all the important things we need to do. If we're thinking particularly in terms of climate change, that is something that desperately needs international cooperation. It's not a matter for just any one country to do. And turning our back on our biggest international partners is an extraordinarily dangerous thing to do. It feels a little bit like a denial of reality in both cases, because both are actually about finding ways to navigate an extraordinarily complicated and difficult world. And actually going alone and denying reality doesn't help us on that. Fundamentally, Liberal Democrats are keen to build a society which is actually one which values community, values belonging, values diversity. That's a world which we can celebrate, but it's not a world we can, or we can generate by turning our back on our neighbours. Thank you very much. Um, would you like to pass the microphone to Paul? Um, Paul, would you like to make a Thank you. I'll, I'll actually stand it up. It's, it's probably easier. I can see you. Hopefully you can all hear me. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I'm not going to talk about party politics at all. I'm going to tell you about me. I know some of you in the audience know me, but the majority of you don't. So I'll give you a little potted history of who I am. Um, at 17, I joined the Royal Air Force. I was born in the North West and I spent 20 years serving my country. I took part in the Falklands War, the First Gulf War, served in Northern Ireland, Africa, Cyprus, Gibraltar, uh, North America and Canada. When I left the Air Force, I was stationed at RAF Witten and I settled in the area. I've now been here for almost 30 years. I started a company in Huntington, which is still operating, both nationally and internationally within the marine industry. So I've served in the armed forces, I've been a businessman, and all of my business has been done or run locally. In addition to that, when I left the Air Force, there was a shortage of magistrates, so I served 14 years as a magistrate on the hunting of bench, uh, here with crime cases. I also specialised in the family proceedings court, uh, hearing cases of divorce, child neglect, and everything. I think I've seen the best and the worst that mankind can do to each other. And I have those experiences. I'm a married man, I think I'm the oldest candidate. I'm 61 next week. Uh, I have between us my wife and I have six children and ten grandchildren. And I've just found out my son's going to give me another grandchild uh, in May of next year. So I am a family man as, as well. I served on Cambridgeshire County Council until 2017 and I was the UK group leader. Yes, I'm a Brexiteer, I know this lady in front of the is a Remainer. I would like to think that this election is not all about Brexit. It's about what sort of democracy and what type of politicians you want in the future. I have been a patron of the Conservative Party. I was a group leader on the County Council for the UK Independence Party, and I was, until Nigel ditched over 300 of us, a parliamentary candidate for the Brexit Party. I firmly believe that we are better off outside the EU for a number of reasons, and I'm sure those will come out later when you ask your questions. But I believe that party politics has had its day in the UK. We are in a position where every more or less everybody I speak to does not trust our current politicians. They do not trust our current parties. They do not believe that they're telling the truth or that they are properly represented. If you elect me as your member of parliament, I can guarantee to you that I will spend every minute I can in this constituency representing it all to the constituents themselves. I will only go to Westminster when I actually have to go there one to represent you, and two to vote. And I will vote how I believe 
my constituents want me to back. So I will be out there talking to you. I will have, I will set up an office, which I will open as often as I can in one of the market towns, and, and I will personally be there to answer your questions. Those of you who've received information from me, flowers, election addresses, everything on there or on any data you view is my personal information. It's my personal home address. It's my personal telephone number. It's my personal email address. And I'm more than happy for people to contact me whenever they want with whatever questions they want and whatever support they want. But as an independent, I will not have a party whip. I will not be representing a political party. So I will be free to represent you. And I believe that's my title. So thank you. I'm sure you'll, uh, you'll be asking me some more questions later. Thank you very much. And now I come to Daniel, who is the uh, candidate for the Green Party. Right, I think I'll stand up. I assume you can all hear me because I can hear me as well. <laughs> so, as you are fully aware now, my name is Daniel Laycock. I'm the Green Party parliamentary candidate for uh, Huntington, St. Ives, and St. Beards. Obviously, it's a very wide range of a constituency. Uh, but I'm going to go on to three things. First of all, an empty chair. Our MP of so many years has decided not to turn up. Now that is itself not democracy. Because if he does not turn up, you want to ask him questions on why he's not doing certain things on Brexit, on the climate crisis, on roads, on transport. But he's too scared to show up. And he's not the only one. There are conservative candidates across the country not going to hustings to be uh, accountable or, and to be scrutinised for their actions that they do in Parliament and in their own constituency. Now, I would probably advise you all not to vote Conservative in this election. Because at the end of the day, we are facing not only a climate crisis, but Brexit. As the saying is now being said throughout this campaign, when Boris Johnson was elected as Prime Minister, get Brexit done. And me and Paul are going to utterly disagree on this issue. Because, like Paul, now this is a huge admittance for me, but I voted to leave in 2016, which is a pretty shock if you're a Green candidate. But there are so many people within the parties, about 3% of them, voted to leave. And now since October last year, I actually changed my mind. So I don't want to leave the European Union. I've actually already been to Brussels myself. And I've seen how it functions, how it works. And you know, there's no going to be EU army. But the third point, we face a climate crisis. We are on the verge of having irreversible damage on our planet, on our communities. Uh, and that if we don't reverse that by 2030, we will see a catastrophe. Our temperatures will rise even further by three degrees, sea level rises will continue, and animals will die, and then so will we. That, unfortunately, is now the reality that we're facing. But if you vote green on December 12th, you're not only just voting to end this nightmare, because the Green Party supports having a second referendum, going back to the people and letting them decide what steps they want to take next, because of that, is better, more democracy is better in our society, not less. Yes, we're having a general election. This is more democracy. But that's why if you vote green, you'll get a Green New Deal, you'll see a transformation throughout the country on our rails to end austerity, to end this nightmare with the NHS, more money for the NHS, but also to have a Green New Deal that's going to fix our energy system, to fix our transport system, to see cheap buses, free buses, to have an energy system that will provide a renewable energy. But that's why we have to work together. And I hope every single person on this panel will agree that we have to work together. Our political system is so broken, it's unrecognisable. There's people in the audience that are just going to be voting for the first ever time. This is their future if we don't change things now. If not now, when? Thank you very much indeed. Um, well, within your five minutes, um, Sandra Sweet for the Labour Party. I'm going to conform and stand up as well. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, yeah. Um, right, well, what can I say? I mean, 
Jonathan Ginogli not showing up tonight is really, it's, you know, life imitating art in many ways. It's, it's the story of his 18 years as your MP. He's never showed up for you once. Even if he has showed up in person, he has not listened to you. You do not feel represented by him. I can almost you know, assure you of that, that he certainly is not out to serve you. So, why is he not here? We're nine years now into, into, into Tory austerity in Britain. We're, we've got public services at breaking point, and NHS, our schools, also at breaking point. And Jonathan Ginogli does not think that he needs to be held accountable to you for this. To me, that's disgraceful. To me, he does not deserve to represent you because he is not representing you. I am up here because I want to earn your vote. I do not believe that I am entitled to stand up here and tell you what I believe and tell you what's what. You need to tell me that, and I will listen. Jonathan Ginogli has known nothing but a life of privilege, and he does not know how lucky he is to have that. There are people out in this country, in this town, who are struggling, and that needs to end. So where are we now? We are here in St. Ian's. We're in a society which has been let down and left behind by the last four years of conservative rule and the five years before that of coalition governments which have torn this country apart. With me, I'm standing on a platform for real change in our country. I'm standing on a platform to end austerity. I'm standing on a platform to give people a fair day's pay for a fair day's work. I'm standing here because I want to earn your vote. Because I believe this country needs change. And there are so many people out there who I have been fortunate enough to speak to on the doorsteps throughout this campaign who don't know what, what's going to happen, what the future holds for them in the next couple of years. The next couple of days, the next couple of weeks are a mystery to them because they are struggling to get by and I say no more. So what are we offering here? I, as, as you know, I'm standing here as Labour's representative for our constituency. I, I was born at Hinchinbrook Hospital and I've lived in the Huntingdonshire area all of my life and it's a pleasure for me to be raising my children in this area. It's a brilliant area, it's a brilliant community and it's devastating to me that even though I'm, I'm maybe the youngest one on the stage, that in such a short space of time how much things have changed. I remember growing up living on the Oxmoor in Huntingdon and Represent. And, um, <laughs> and, um, and what we had then was different to what we have now. We have, a, we have a society now which is pitted against one another. Back then it was different. We used to, everybody used to come together. If people were running out of milk in their house, you would pop next door and people would give it to you. But now people can't even afford to do that. Society has been pitted against one another for too long. And what we need now is to build a society that no longer walks on by while they see their neighbour struggling. We need to build a society and a world that cooperates one with one another because we are in a really difficult situation at the minute. As Daniel has said, we're in the middle of a climate crisis and if we don't act on that soon, then that's game over for us. Not just for us, but for our children and our children's children, for our native species and for our planet overall. So what we have now is a once in a lifetime opportunity to elect a government that will transform this country that will bring this country back from breaking point, that, sorry, that, will, that, will, that will save our NHS, that will save our schools, that will preserve our children's future. And, so, and as Jonathan Ginogli has sent us a message tonight, I think it's only right that in this election we send him a message. And to him I say that real change is coming, and that change is coming now.
exactly what the source is. Go on. Why don't you stand up, sir? <laughs> So 
So I'll only speak for a second because obviously there's a lot we need to get through tonight. But I think generally this kind of thing, because it has happened nationally, just eats into the, the wider issue of trust in the political system and politicians as a whole. I stand myself on the platform of complete and total honesty about me and everything <coughs> I am and everything that I've ever done and everything that I stand to represent. And you know, I just think that generally, and this goes for all parties, that just nationally everybody needs to strive to do a little bit better and that's exactly what I am doing. Thank you. Shall we take another question? Yeah. I'll speak loudly. At least 97% of the published climate scientists agree that climate warming trends are extremely likely due to human activities. Most leading science organisations have endorsed this position. In the light of these warnings and part of the reports to the IPCC, please explain your party's carbon neutral target and the steps planned to implement it. For those who didn't hear that, 94% um, uh, of, uh, 97, thank you, um, percent of uh, climate change is caused by human activity. That's a, a, a statistic from? From the uh, NASA. Okay, uh, from NASA. Um, what, do each of, what is each of the parties' target and how do they propose to meet it? Um, Sam, would you like to go first? So obviously the, the question itself is probably the biggest and most important question any political candidate of any party of any election has ever faced. That's first and foremost a given, I think. So in regards to, to, to your question, so I'm very proud at this point to be standing on Labour's manifesto because I believe that not only do, is, do we need to address the massive issues and divides in our country, but I think we need to address the massive climate crisis of which we have found ourselves in. So on that Labour's policy, which I've been, which we have just, I've been you know, in a position of complete pleasure to have seen develop over the last year for our Green New Deal, which is very much based on, Labor, uh, on the, the Sunrise Movement in the United States of America with the work of Representative Ocasio-Cortez and, and many others who have been involved in that. And basically what that looks at is that first and foremost the accountability and responsibility of big polluters and big businesses who are essentially funding projects which are contributing to climate change uh, and deforestation and the loss of habitats and, and species. So I think you know, with accountability what we need to be looking at is making sure that those people are legislated out of essentially their, their business practices which are having a devastating effect on our planet and on our climate. But what we need to do is also look at the way our economy works. Um, obviously, there are many jobs and you know, industries in this country and across the world which rely heavily on fossil fuels and, what, what, and, and obviously scientists have, have been studying this kind of thing for a number of years and what they found is that there's only a certain level of sustainability in, in a lot of the industries and we've come to a point now where we have to really be considering where we're going to go next. And so what, what I'm very proud to stand on our manifesto is what we are calling our Green Industrial Revolution, which is where we're going to be moving away from the fossil fuel industries and moving over into sustainable industries such as solar power, uh, wind, tidal energy, um, and as I said, coming away from fossil fuel. And as well as that, it's worth noting that Labour are committed to banning fracking, um, which is something I'm absolutely delighted about. <laughs> So we have a manifesto as well. We are we're committed to massive investment in the industries, coming away, building enough solar panels to cover 22,000 football pitches across the UK. We want to be building 7,000 um, uh, wind turbines and 2,000 additional wind turbines uh, in our oceans as well to, to ensure that we're sustainable. We want to be putting solar panels as well on top of our community buildings, uh, at libraries, at schools, to make sure they are sustainable for the future. Um, because obviously we need to be looking out as well for the future of our communities and the future of our children. We need to be looking at how we can save our schools money, and particularly in these difficult and tough times, and things are only going to get worse for the most disadvantaged in society if we don't address the climate crisis. So, um, in addition to that, we'll be planting a billion trees across the space of 20 years. It's an incredibly ambitious target. It's a, it's a, it's a realistic target as well as that. 
we need to be looking as well at how we stop our businesses, who we have an element of control over, contributing to deforestation in the Amazon, in other rainforests around the world. We need to end the unsustainable palm oil, palm oil trade, and we need to be restoring habitats here and across the world. I believe that Labour Party has the best policies in regards to fighting the climate crisis. There's a lot of agreement between a few of the parties in the direction we should go, and we plan to decarbonise our economy by 2030. Again, it's a very ambitious target, but it's a necessary and realistic ambitious target, and I'm proud to stand on that platform. Thank you. Um... Actually, no, we do. There's quite a lot of actually alignment between ourselves and Labour. Uh, the Green Party have actually been working on uh, a, uh, a climate. Uh, oh, I forgot what I was going to say now. Target. There we go. That was the word. Um, and we've had a um, Green New Deal. That was what I was going to say. Gosh, it went square on my head. It's really three words. It's not hard. And so, yeah, so we've had uh, a Green New Deal within our policy for the last uh, about eight years now. And Caroline Lucas has been working on a Green New Deal group with Anne Buffette and Richard Murphy for the past 12 years. So we know specifically what is going to be needed to, to change, not only just our economy, but we'll also do a, a decarbonisation of our economy, but we'll also have a climate chancellor. We won't have a normal chancellor just go, yes, we're going to be spending X, Y, Z on everything, because they're using fossil fuels that's subsidised. We'll cut fossil fuels completely in a transitional period up until 2030, but we'll also use, uh, within a carbon budget, we won't use GDP, but we'll use emissions. Missions to look at how well we're doing. Are we doing enough? Do we need to do more in different parts of industry, in energy, in housing, in planning? Would make sure that planning is done differently to how it's done now. As I know that an independent councillor, Derek Giles, has been shouting from the rooftops of the district council for so many years. Let's do it differently. Let's do infrastructure first before building. Because if you build first, you're not going to have the infrastructure available to you. And that's why we would do things a lot differently. But also ban HS2, the most ridiculous amounts of spending on HS2, where that could be used to local transport, on buses, on free buses, on cheap buses for people to get around, to go from Huntingdon to St. Leeds without worrying about how much is it going to cost? Am I going to be able to get to to the job centre, because the job centre is now going to be closed in St. Leeds. We'll also ban airport expansion. More airport expansion isn't going to help us decarbonise, it's going to increase it. It's not helpful at all. And so, but also, because I know that today I've also seen that um, within the GDP, five, no, six and a half percent of fossil fuels is subsidised from that. Worldwide. That's six and a half percent that's being used on fossil fuels worldwide. So there has to be a huge dramatic change over a transitional period of 10 years. Uh, we'll also, we'll also plant, plant trees as well. A bit less of labour, obviously. It's like a fight on who many, how many trees are going to be planted, really. <laughs> Which is really silly. It's like, but we need to plant trees. And I've seen the work that's been happening in certain years. Um, <coughs> I haven't been, in a way, I have been a little bit criticising because there is so much to do and it is really frustrating because we have a government, kind of, kind of government, has no majority, that isn't de dealing with the serious crisis, crisis that we have. So, me and myself, I actually work for the Green Party and so I've been reading through the manifesto, I've been going on to conferences and kind of seeing the shape of how a Green New Deal would look. So it would massively change the energy sector. So instead of it being fossil fuel based, it would be renewable energy. So every single person would have heatable homes, retrofitted homes. Uh, we would do uh, we'll ban coal mines as well. Um, but we'll also have greener jobs. So instead of everyone having a green job 
from one day to the uh, a fossil fuel job from one day to the next, we'll try to transition people over. But that's the way forward. Because if we don't start doing this now, then I hugely fear for what's going to happen over the next few years. And especially with um, ocean rising, uh, temperature rising too. I am fearful for not only my future, but so many kids' futures too. Because it's their future that we have to change for the better. Thank you. Um, Paul? Thank you. Uh, well, I'm a party of one. Uh, so I will tell you what I think, and I knew that climate change would probably come up at some time. Let's make no bones about it. Climate change is happening. But <coughs> the data you quoted, sir, from NASA is in excess of five years old. And the majority of scientists have now decided that actually climate change is not man made. It can be. <laughs> It, the, the actual report was, I remember reading it, but you've yeah. got lots of reports, people 
saying this is the whole hottest year we've had for a long time. But we go back 50 years, you know, flooding, all the rest of it. You know, the same flooding is caused by climate change. I'll tell you what caused most of the flooding in this country, it's the European waterway. Wait, <laughs> This is the sort of thing we're up against. Okay, the River Great Tuesday. Okay, I made my living out of that river, I had two personal vessels on it. When I first started working in Hampton, the river's depth was an average of 17 feet. That's how deep it was. It's now an average of 3 feet deep. We're still trying to pour the same amount of water down a tube that has now gone from 17 to 3 feet. You just physically can't do it. As soon as you make a river navigable, the flow stops and sediment settles on the bottom. And as the sediment comes up, it gets more sunlight and you get weed growth. Okay, you get weed growth that decays and it exacerbates the problem. So you end up with a river that is just silting up all the time. You have to de silt or dredge. But the waterway is directive, prohibits us from doing that now. Because there is a possibility there might be heavy metals in the sediment. So we get floods. We build on the floodplain. There are lots and lots of things happening out there that are causing the changes to our weather. Uh, but you need scientific data. You can't sail or win what's happening. I'd like to ask if we could actually pull Mark into this now. Thank you. Bye bye. I can't listen to that crap. Um, we're in different universes. Um, for once, I'm going to quote Margaret Thatcher. Um, because I think possibly her, her, her saving grace was as the first major British political leader to take this one seriously. An awfully long time ago. From where I'm standing, it's very clear that there is a problem, and it's very clear that man made or human activity is driving this. Um, and if, it, if there's a whisker of doubt on it, it actually makes human action against CO2 emission even more important. Because if something is driving this and reducing CO2 levels, it's something we can do, we should do it. But if I just take a step back for a moment, if you are confronted with a really serious piece of news, a really scary piece of news, like in five years' time, we will be having enough methane coming out of melting permafrost to actually accelerate climate change, like retreating ice caps accelerate climate change. Within the next five years, we're getting a serious problem. If you've got a horrible, horrible piece of news like the prospect of the Indian subcontinent becoming uninhabitable, and therefore an awful lot of people having to move, or a war if we don't actually find a peaceful way to do that, that those things are pretty scary. There are two absolutely normal reactions to that. One reaction is to deny it. And I think that's what's going on with climate change denial. It's not that it isn't true, it's desperately to hope it isn't true. The other one is to get into a fight about it. And then we argue about all this, that and the other, and often we allow our familiar hobby horses because those have helped us in the past. Neither of those are any use when we are facing a major crisis. Um, personally on this one, I work backwards. If we were to face a war in 30 years' time because of scarce resources, that will cost an absolute fortune. We can spend a fraction of that now and actually deal with the problem, and that makes, looks much better for everyone. Having spoken about those very human reactions, I think it's absolutely essential we take people with us on this. Um, Having praised Margaret Thatcher, I'll praise the last Labour government, because they had a fuel price escalator on, whose aim was to repeatedly increase fuel prices to reduce CO2 emissions by simply pricing it out. And that went until we had a lorry driver strike. And the sense was that public opinion wasn't actually with the government on this. Right now, we have to take people with us. The 10 targets will sound very familiar, lots of trees. Major work on all the households that people know and come to, to insulate them, aiming to get 80% of our um, fuel, for, sorry, 80% of our energy from renewable sources by 2030 and the rest by 2040. These are all moving targets because actually we're in a world that needs serious cooperation. 
Um, a while back, I did some work with somebody who was working with David Mackay, who at the time was the government's climate change advisor. And um, then the David worked out that actually you could meet the whole of Europe's fuel needs from a large, rather specialised solar array in the Sahara. To make that work, you have to have enough political stability in Europe and in North Africa for there to be the cooperation to make that viable. That is a hugely complicated people issue as well. I've heard stridency from some people fighting familiar battles. Um, I mean, in the last couple of months, I've had somebody tell me that this is all the fault of men being in charge, so they mentioned they were over. I've heard people say it's all the fault of capitalism, so we should get rid of capitalism. It's all the fault of colonial powers, so they should deal with the problem. It's all the wrong, so they should make it for the young. Which are all the very familiar hobby horses. This is actually a time where we have to say this is a new problem. A new problem where we have to actually work together. Um, there's something about different parties' biases in this, in the sense that Lib Dems are talking about 100 billion of investment, brackets never in the private sector for some of that, which is actually about cooperation to build action on climate change rather than enforce it. But I think fundamentally the task for us now is to start with the cooperation that's needed. It's inevitably a social change, but let that flow from how people react to this. So we then find a way to build ourselves towards something sensible. And the target people quoting, bear in mind that the IPCC are skeptical of some of the sooner ones. But that actually is everything still a very good reason for us to cooperate as much as we can to deal with this as quickly as we possibly can and deal with the fact that some other parts of the world are going to lag behind, which actually puts the pressure on us to be, to be taking up a position for you. Thank you. I saw Daniel shaking his head. Did you want to say anything in, uh, in addition to what you've already said about that? So, unfortunately, the Lib Dems are kind of lagging behind. The IPC report, actually, so the UN as well, are now saying we're not doing enough. We are lagging behind fastly, and if we do not act within the next few months, we will not be able to reverse this. That is the simple, plain truth, unfortunately. So, this isn't an attack against Mark, this is on the policy that the Lib Dems actually have. Um, and it's got to change. We have to change that policy, we have to work together, because this is now not party politics. This is far from that. This is planning. It's planning or nothing. And I think every single Except Paul, obviously. <laughs> Pretty much all of us agree on that issue, that we have to work together. There are things within the Labour manifesto on climate crisis I may not agree with, but it's about us working together to say, okay, what can we do? We have to work together. And this is where politics can change things too. If we work together, we can build a better society together. And I think that's what every single person wants. We want to be able to have an affordability on our lives, travel easily, without worrying about how much it's going to cost if we're going to... It took me four hours to get here tonight, from Bury St Edwards. Four hours worth of train cancellations. I know, that's off topic a little bit. But, but that's what we're facing. We've got to change the system as a whole. And we have to be in the system to change it. If we're outside, we're not going to be able to change much. We have to be inside. So whoever is elected, maybe him, if he's here, we've got to do something. No matter if it's Conservative, Labour, Lib Dem, Ply Cymru, SNP, anyone from around the country is going to get elected on December 12th. We have this man of task. But Brexit isn't helping this. Brexit's actually making the issue worse because we're not dealing with this climate emergency. So I hope, I know that St Neats are leading the way in the district because it's the only one in the district that's doing anything. But we've got to work together. So let's do that. So 
thank you for your question. It's, it's a very, very question one, and uh, sorry, very important question, and it is one that I'm absolutely committed, whether or not I'm elected, we need to end the use of food banks. It's as simple as that. I <laughs> And I believe if, if Jonathan were here, which he's not, <laughs> and he hasn't been for 18 years, um, is that what we need to, what he would say is that food banks, and he has said this, he said this in the, in the Huntington Hustings just last weekend, that food banks are a good thing. Food banks show the charitable side of society. Let me tell you, Jonathan Ginocchi is wrong. Food banks are a disgrace. We are one of the richest countries in the entire world, and we have people living in our towns, living in St. Nick's, living across the country, who do not have enough food to survive, who do not have enough food to feed themselves or their children. I, in 20, 2018, I was elected as a councillor in Huntingdon, representing Huntingdon North, which is one of the most deprived, deprived wards in the whole of East of England, in my ward. So we have 7 out of 10 people living in poverty. 6 out of 10 of children in this ward are living in poverty as well. And as I said, we are one of the richest countries in the world. We've got enough money, and we have done for years, to send our bombs across to Syria. We've had enough money to send a bum off to the DUP to buy the Tories a working majority in Parliament. But we've not had this magic money tree to feed our own children. No, 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 no. Not under me and not under a Labour government. So what we're going to do is we're going to increase the national minimum wage in our country. Overnight, if we get a Labour majority, the minimum wage in our country will be £10 an hour. That's what we need to look at first. People who are working 40 hours a week plus several jobs are living in poverty and that's absolutely disgraceful. I mean, I don't even know where to begin. I mean, I'm, I'm sure I probably had some more scripted lines for you on this issue, but it's something I feel so passionate about, so absolutely distraught about, that there are people who live amongst us, you know, who have been absolutely destitute. And so we need to increase the wages. What we also need to do is we need to bring job seekers allowance and carers allowance in line with inflation in the living wage so that those who are unable to work are able to survive. Over 100,000 people in our country since 2010 have died from the result of austerity. We need to end austerity. We need to fund our public services. We have people working in our hospitals, working for the police service, people working for the fire service who do not have enough money, people who risk their lives on a daily basis are essentially slowly and systematically because of our government starving to death. But where is Jonathan Ginogli when you want to ask him about this? Well, he's not here tonight, and if he was here, he would tell you, oh, fuck you, Satan, it's you're a charitable bunch, look at you feeding your neighbours. Well, you know what? The rule one of the state, of our government, is to make sure that their people have enough to survive, not just enough to, to, to make sure they don't die of starvation or the children in schools, or even teachers in schools. Because I've spoken to it, I've, speak, I've had a conversation with a teacher, a trainee teacher, in recent weeks, who I've known for a, you know, a great period of time, and she's, she's confided in me that in her years as a trainee teacher, she used to wait until after school, because of her, her massive rent that she had to pay for her house because of other household bills, she used to wait until after school and look for leftover food in the staff room. She used to go through the fridge in her staff room. And if our teachers aren't having enough, you know, don't have enough money to survive, then who on earth does? It could happen to any one of us. What we also need to be looking at as well, and I'm proud to stand on this policy, the next day the government will scrap universal credit. Two million people have suffered because of the in intense waiting period to receive their benefit payments. Rents have been missed. People have, if they've, they've had to skip meals. I, I remember growing up, and, I've, and I'm very proud to come from a working class family, by the way, and I'm, you know, I've always been proud of my parents and the way that I've been brought up. 
And you know, I had a frank conversation with both my mum, you know, a few years ago, and it will stick with me forever, um, about growing up, because I, we, she used, never used to eat with us, my mum. And I asked her, because she was just saying, well, you know, I'll, I'll eat when you not go to bed. And then a few years ago, I sat with her, and I was like, no, we work well off, but did you actually have them? She said, no. Most of the time, me and your dad, we either had a slice of toast each, or we just would, we would skip a meal. That's a, a background that I'm so proud to come from, but also horrified to come from, because it's even worse now. So I'll, I'll summarise and I'll say, what we need to do is make, make, need to make sure everybody in our country has enough to survive. We need to improve wages, we need to improve conditions, First of all, is the one that will be very hard to go near, though Sam's alluded to it. Being not knowing where your next meal is coming from is a terrifying experience, and it scars people for a very long time. Um, there have been times in our society where we've behaved as if it didn't matter or various judgmental things could be said, but it does real damage. Running the benefit system in a way that reinforces that gives the impression that people on benefits are somehow scroungers also does real damage. Um, just as I said, I'm thinking of an instance on the tube a while back. Somebody got on and was begging. Um, you can be cynical about beggars, but his tears weren't faked. And he was trying to beg £20. And it was a really I don't know what his story was, um, but there was a £20 note in my wallet and I, the thing was to give it to him and then get off the train immediately, so that neither of us saw each other's tears. So there's a sense of something there of the rawness. Translating that back into policy, which is kind of a politician's job, what we're saying as Lib Dems is, with universal credit, there's the conversation about what we replace it with, but there is the immediate issue of changing the five weeks to five days for the money to arrive. And there's all sorts of arguments about why it's five weeks, but whatever the logic, we're seeing horrible numbers of people facing real difficulties in that waiting room. Pulling the lens back a little bit, people are mentioning austerity. It's worth reminding people that in 2010, Labour and Lib Dems and Conservatives were all talking about the need for austerity. And that was all about actually dealing with the fallout of the financial crash. There is something about responsible management of the nation's finances to mean that if we get hit by another crisis like that, we have a little bit of give in the system so we don't have to do something as drastic. Where I take issue with our former coalition partners is that there is a sense for the Tories of something ideological in that. There is a massive difference between cutting because you haven't got an option, and cutting because you believe that cuts are a good thing. And when you saw the end of the coalition and the Tories coming into power on their own, you then saw that coming into its ugly reality. I think of George Osborne taking, I think it was five million out of the universal credit budget as an attempt to save money. You don't introduce a new benefit and then take a slab of money out of it and expect it to work. I have to say, part of this needs a very targeted action. Um, Lib Dems are talking about money for very early years, and that's because if somebody is born in poverty, they tend to stay in poverty. So actually prioritising early years is really important for someone's lifetime for their stability. And training, to enable, training money for people as adults is really important for later changes. And over all of this, we have the horrible shadow of Brexit. Because criticising as people might, what the EU has done is have a mindset of directing money towards the places where it's needed. Just after the referendum, there was a wonderful story, a horrible story, of Cornwall voting leave, and then Cornwall County Council approaching the government and saying, Can you guarantee we will still get the money we've been getting from Brussels? No. Um, 
People criticise Brussels for doing that, but the way they've done it is actually where is the money needed, not what is the national politics. That's a mindset we will sorely miss. In very practical terms, one of the other scourges we're dealing with is zero hours contracts. The messy space between employment and self-employment, and we're talking about a status halfway between the two to stop people getting away with not treating people fairly because they're not fully employed. But the fundamental here is we do also have to keep an eye on the basic economics. If we are too generous, the danger is we end up with putting up living wages and then seeing unemployment rising. And that is also destructive. So actually we need to be thinking about economic policies that keep people actually in employment in earning, as well as pushing their income up. Thank you. I'd just like to take uh, exception to one of the things you stated. Let's not forget, we are a net contributor to the EU. The money we get from Brussels, we've already paid that into Brussels, plus a tax like more. So it's our money in the first place, and if we come out of Europe, we will have more money to spend on things we, we want to spend it on. But let's make one thing. We are the fifth richest country in the world. Some are saying six now, we've gone down, down a little bit. But it is a national disgrace that we have food banks. And there are people that genuinely need those and are genuinely struggling. I've seen that in my past political experiences. But the reason we got food banks is not because of people, it's because of successive governments wasting your money. And if every single party has a stake in this, it shouldn't happen. We have a tax system that is unfair. We have a system of local government taxation by council tax, which is unfair. Everything we've got is unfair, but people that genuinely need benefits are not getting it. It's not working. We know that it's a you know, problem. But we also have people claiming benefits that shouldn't be having them in the first place. Um, so let's not you know, make a cost. Not everybody on benefits deserves to have that. Uh, and we need to look at all of this, and we shouldn't be doing it. But to charge somebody earning hundreds of thousand pounds, exactly the same council tax as somebody who's got four children who has to have the same kind of house to house them, is inherently wrong. And we should have a much fairer tax system, and if we did, I believe that we could get rid of, get rid of food banks fairly quickly by changing it. But make no mistake, the problems we have now are all to do with party politics. They're to do one. Look at what the parties are promising you now. Any 10-year school child who gets pocket money knows that they can't buy something once they've spent the pocket money. Okay. Governments don't seem to know that. Political parties don't seem to know that. I spoke to a Lib Dem councillor and came to the council who said, well, we'll just borrow more money. I said, are you going to pay that? She said, no. It's not real money anywhere. We can just borrow as much as we buy. But we can't. We need to balance the books. We need to pay for what we need, and we need to care for those who need care. But you know, look at what, what they've all promised you in this election. You know, even the Tories are promising billions and billions. We're going to hit 33 trillion in debt if they carry out their election promises. And you know what? I don't believe whichever government gets in will carry out its election promises. Because I can't remember one carrying out its election promises for the last 20 years. And look at the last three and a half years. Every single party said we will leave the EU. We're still in. Every single MP said they'd back their party manifesto. And look at the squabbles in Parliament. We need people in Parliament who are real people, who are not career politicians, who know how difficult it is to make a living, who know where that money goes, who aren't earning £80,000 a year, and if I get into Parliament, I'll do all I can to cut MPs' salaries and expenses, because ex MPs' expenses, as far as I'm concerned, is legalised fraud. <coughs> you should not need expenses to do a job you have volunteered for. When I was on Cainshire County Council, we were lucky. We had 13 UK councillors. We actually held the balance of power. We stopped any increase whilst we were there 
in council's allowances. We stopped any increase in council's expenses. We changed the, which I believe is inherently wrong, the cabinet system of government and changed it to a political system, which meant we had collective responsibility, collective decision making, and you know what? It actually worked. What happened when we left that and they got Conservative majority again? The first thing they did was put up councillors' allowances. Not one councillor argued against that. We got to cut the little way from food banks. Sorry? Uh, it's this is what it's all about. It's wasting public money. Yeah. And we shouldn't do it. We shouldn't be wasting public money. Okay. Do I pass the uh, microphone to Simon? I'm not going to talk about Brexit. I've spoken about Brexit a couple of times now. So, I'm going to speak on a personal capacity, not party policy. There's one thing I would do with food banks. Ban. Get rid of them. Because it's just wrong. We're in the 23rd century. I know how, how hard it can be. When my parents were divorced, uh, we lost the house, moved to Peterborough, into a B&B, &B. it was there for six months. So I know how difficult things can be, I've been there, it's, it's really awful. I've seen my mum not go around food for days, and fed me and my brother. And that was, what, 12 years ago? So, it's hard, it really is hard. And we, I think me and Sam come from actually the same kind of uh, area, the Oxmoor. Grew up in the Oxmoor, I know, <laughs> We're brothers, really. <laughs> but the question is, what would we do to reduce them? I would ban them, but I would try to do what we can to help those who are struggling on a day-to-day -day basis. People literally don't know what they're doing. We saw the Channel 4 Dispatch programme. Oh my God, how heartbreaking is that? That's not how it's supposed to be. As we've said, we're the, one of the fifth largest countries in the world, and we can't help our own. Now this isn't about Brexit, this is literally about what we need to do. We have to change things for the better. Because if we don't, we're going to be stuck in the same system for another five years. Um, now I'll come briefly on to Greek party policy, uh, but I want to give you a fact, and this is actually quite horrifying. The Trussell Trust have said, and I think every single one of us have got emails from the Trussell Trust to state how many children received emergency food parcels between April and September this year. 2,271. And that's what we're living with. That's what's happening every single day. That's only a small proportion, and it's gone up from last year. 4% has gone up from the same period in 2018. So food banks... When people go to food banks, it's very, very degrading for them, and they are ashamed to be there. Now, if you went into a church who was providing food, you wouldn't feel as much shame, but you know that the church is there to provide to the poor, to those in poverty. And churches aren't just about giving to people, but they're there to be supportive to people. So, with our policy, we would also actually introduce uh, a universal basic, a basic income. So every single person, yes, this does include rich people, unfortunately, don't ask me why, I want to change that and have a few tier system where those who are rich don't get it. Um, but that's my personal opinion, Part of love me for saying that. Um, but we'll have a, um, a universal basic income, a UBI, so every single person will receive £89 per week. Uh, parents would receive, uh, pensions would receive £175, £10 more than they already do, but it will also go increase via the um, inflation. So it will also raise the, uh, the national living wage to £12 per hour. So it's increasing people's pocket in their money every single week or month. And, get, well, I, I would personally get rid of zero hour contracts. We'd have flexible contracts with people who would work with your employees, you can actually have that flexibility. So if you want to work 32 hours one week, you can work 32 hours a week. If you want to work from home, you can work from home nine to five. 
it's down to what people want, but we have to work with employees so we can do that. But there could be incentivized, uh, incentives and incentivized. Um, I must speak English. Oh, gosh. Um, there must be incentives for those who, who want to do things differently, who want to work differently. But also include a full day working week. Um, we've, we've had that policy for years, but it's crucial. So many countries are doing a full day week and it works. You've seen productivity in France. It's gone up, it's gone through the roof. And it worked because people have that flexibility. So if they want to work on a Monday to Thursday, they have the long weekend off. Or if they want to work a Tuesday to a Friday, they can do. It's flexibility to those. So in answer to your question, I'll ban them. They should be against the law for a start. But two, we need to invest more, increasing the national living wage, having a, a universal basic income, having a four-day working week, and so we lift those people out of poverty so they can have a better life for themselves. That's what we would do as a Green Party. Thank you. Could I just ask you to clarify one statement which you've made, made it several times, and that is, because on behalf, I know there are some people here who volunteer on food bank and something else, um, because I've recognised one or two faces of that. Um, when you say you would ban food banks, does that mean the Green Party would actively introduce legislation to make food banks illegal? That, that's in my personal opinion. And how would that work? Well, I'll try and get as many people to co sign the legislation so we can actually pass through. But it would also have to come through. Uh, so, to obviously to, to change the system, we would obviously introduce a universal basic income. So, that means that people actually, instead of being in poverty, it would lift a certain amount of people out of poverty, but there's, there's so much more work to do. It's not about just throwing money at it, it's about trying to help those who need it. And it's, it's I think there's a lot of policy that we've got so we can change the system for the, for the better, because obviously I know that we would um, keep the housing benefits as it is. Uh, we'd also keep uh, another benefit, I can't remember what it is now. Uh, but I know we would uh, incorporate every single other benefit into the universal basic income. So it would actually be as one, instead of having um, uh, a separate one. And but, because I know that we, we also want to um, get rid of universal credit too, because it just doesn't work. Okay, thank you. Shall we take another question? The hand right at the back there. Hi there. Uh, I just want to address um, the universal basic income that you've just been talking about, Daniel. Um, you're saying 89 pounds a week to every single person in the country. Uh, assuming there's about 70 million people in the country, I've just done the maths on it, uh, the total cost of that is going to be £322 billion per year. How on earth would we pay that when that is a third of the entire country's budget for the whole year? Okay, um, thanks for that. <laughs> you put me right on the spot. Um, I'm going to be perfectly honest, I don't have the details of at hand, I can't materialise and go, well, this is how. I can, I'm more than happy to speak to you after, and we can speak face to face. I'll go to the pub with them, we'll have a pint. Um, but I'm more than happy to do that. Um, just to pick up your question, um, the universal basic income isn't the dead policy at the moment, but it's certainly something we've spoken about. The suggestion, which I think might be what other people are suggesting as well, is that you introduce it and you also change the tax system so that for people who are nowhere near needing benefits, the state's giving with one hand and taking away with the other so that it's neutral. But the subtlety of this is there's two subtleties. One is that there is a really pernicious place, which is when somebody falls into the benefit, so suddenly they're without. Whereas if you can guarantee that money is reaching everybody all the time, you never actually get that point of suffering. The second subtlety is that there is concern about how the large economy is changing the world as one of the drivers on a minority getting very rich and everybody else losing out. And one of the ways of really balancing that is again careful use of the tax system and universal basic income. The reason why it isn't in the Lib Dem Manifesto is that if we were elected in just over a week's time, we couldn't turn around and say, we will implement this now, because there's actually all sorts of work that would need to be done to go from it being a good idea to something you can actually implement. So this is about getting to that place. But my own personal view is that if we can get it right, 
that deals with most or almost all of the inequities of the benefit system, and in particular the nasty little traps that have vicious effects on them, and allows us to build a world that's, that handles more fairly the possibility of the, those who benefit from the knowledge economy benefiting disproportionately. Thank you. Lady in front. Would the candidates uh, increase or decrease and retain the GDP for foreign aid? Very um, much. I've got the microphone. My personal opinion is that charity begins at home, um, but our foreign aid policy is something else that needs changing. At the moment, we give cash to corrupt governments across the world, and that money it ends up going somewhere else than where it's intended. I think we can change the foreign aid policy where we provide aid where it's needed. So for example, if children in country A need vaccinations against something, we send people out there with the vaccinations and vaccinate them, rather than sending the money to do it. There are lots of things we can do with foreign aid, but the way we do it at the moment for example, the biggest single foreign aid contribution last year was to Price Waterhouse Coopers. Because they're the auditors that the government uses to decide where foreign aid goes. We don't need that. You know, if we need aid, I'll give you an example. When I was serving in Africa some time ago, there was a severe drought and lots of malnutrition. We, I think, sent, we sent some of our forces to help, I was one of them, uh, but we mainly sent tents and blankets for them to live in. The Americans sent a nuclear aircraft carrier. The country concerned said to the Americans, why have you sent a nuclear aircraft carrier? Take it away, we don't want it. The American general who was on that aircraft carrier at the time says, we've sent this because we have a desalination plant on board that can provide more fresh water than you actually need. We have a hospital on board that can provide the medical facilities that you need. We have enough food on board to keep your country fed for the next six months. And we have enough nuclear generated power on board that we can plug into your national grid to give you the power you need to get out of the trouble you're in. Now that is foreign aid that I believe we should be giving. It wasn't money, it was real assistance. And yes, will we spend the same? I don't believe we need to spend as much. I believe we can give more foreign aid where it's needed for less money if we do it differently. Thank you very much. Uh, Sandra, would you like to comment on Labour Farm policy and pay for foreign aid? So, <clears throat> as things currently stand, um, I believe that this, this is an issue that goes, you know, not just beyond the amounts of money we give, which is 0.7% of our gross, uh, sorry, of GDP. Uh, what I believe in is that we need to retain that first and foremost. But what we also need to be doing, as we alluded to earlier, uh, is investing first and foremost in, in uh, policies to prevent the climate crisis. Now, a lot of people who are in areas that are in need of assistance and foreign aid are they going to be the first people and are the first people who are suffering at the hands of the climate crisis and climate change, which leads to poverty, drought, famine, and wars over resources. Obviously, many, most of the people who are fleeing their homelands do so for these reasons. Um, that in itself, and you know, there are our policies, and the government's policies on immigration is a different conversation. What I say is that, as we've said in the previous answer, we are one of the biggest economies in the world. Now, to me, that means that we have an element of responsibility for those who are less fortunate than ourselves. So, for me, it's about, yes, we need to, to, to an extent, I do actually agree with Paul, and that'll probably be the first time I will say that, and only time I will say that tonight. Um, but yes, we do need to look at, at how we are using our foreign, foreign aid, and I don't think that necessarily means cutting down the actual number. I do think, yes, we need to be looking at what is the individual need 
of each region, of each country, which you know, our Department for International Development is currently assisting. So, yes, we need to fund that, but what we need to do, as I said, is we need to, this is why it's so important to, for me to deal with the climate crisis, because it's only going to get worse. So massive investment is what we need in environmental policies, because that's, gonna, that's the very start of a chain of events, which will only mean that we either need to increase our DFID budget, or, you know, or more people will be coming to our country seeking our assistance. And that, as I said at this point, I do believe as one of the wealthiest countries in the world, we have that element of responsibility. So, in, in summary, what I would say, and I get that a lot of people have the, the, obviously, the opinion we need to begin our charity at home. And again, to an extent, I do agree with them, as I said. I believe it's an absolute disgrace that we have people living in poverty in our own country. But, for me, I consider myself an international socialist, so I'm not just about supporting the people who are right around me, of course I do, and that's exactly what I want to do. But for me, not just as a country, but as a person and as a representative, I feel an air of responsibility. We each, I mean I'm sure the gentleman up here will agree with me, have this, this unique sort of privilege to be up here taking your questions and saying how we would deal with various things in our country and across the world. And for me, as I've said, we need to be dealing with the climate crisis, we need to be addressing the issues of that we cause and further fallout from that. And we need to ensure that we are using our money and our foreign aid well. And, but I believe that first and foremost it needs to be fully funded. But as well as that, it, it comes into the wider issue of climate change. And again, I believe as well we need to st stop, as a country, selling arms abroad. I think that in itself is a massive issue and a huge reason that people are in need of assistance in the first place. Now, I'm, I'm in a slightly rare twist, I'm, I'm sort of up here not bigging up the previous Labour government because I do believe that our foreign policy from 1997 to 2010 leaves really little to be envied and has caused, in some ways, a number of the issues that are faced by our brothers and sisters across the world. Um, and for me, what I'm doing up here is saying that we are in a new era at this point, you know, not just as a Labour Party, but as a society as a whole. I think that a lot of things have changed in quite a short space of time in the grander scheme of things. But we each do have a responsibility, and I'm proud of my party's uh, foreign policy and our commitments to fully funding the Department for International Development and ensuring that people across the world who are in crisis are receiving that support. I've gone on a bit, but in short, yes, I do support the current GDP rate, but there is so much more we need to do across various spectrums of policy. Now, of course, let's have a let them policy on this. Thank you. Um, very much in support of at least maintaining the present level. There's a whole raft of reasons for this um, and complications. One of the complications is that if you're giving aid, it inevitably affects the country to whom you give it. And you can quite easily inadvertently apply all sorts of values to that country in a way that's actually quite harmful. But that's not a reason not to try. If we weren't worrying about climate change, we'd have a different narrative. But the climate change narrative means we have to be thinking very seriously about cooperation. Um, I have a friend who is Indonesian and lives in the village he was born in. From his perspective, burning down a chunk of forest to get some land to farm makes sense. You need to be able to think about international aid as a way of saying somebody to that place, please don't. Not don't farm the land, but can we pay you to look after your forest because we need that. So the whole, and that's, in a sense, it's moving out of aid, it's into other territory, but it's about interconnectedness. In very pragmatic terms, some of our aid budget is being used to solve problems before they hit our shores. People get in this country get worried about immigration, want to say rude things about people who come here as economic migrants, but if your country has just fallen apart and you have to leave the country, where do you go? In a very self-interested way, it actually makes sense for the British government to spend some money in your home country so that it doesn't fall apart. 
And that's one of the priorities of, our, of the age budget, where it gets used. We can be cynical about that, but certainly turning our back on it isn't going to help. Personally, you'll have picked up that I very much hope we find a way out of Brexit. If we don't, one of the problems it will throw up is a loss of British influence. And again, slightly cynically, we have used our aid budget to project British soft power. If we have actually lost influence by tumbling out of the European Union, it might very, very well be in our national interest to do more to project soft power, because we never actually quite know where it's going to turn around and help us. But absolutely fundamentally, we have a major global problem with climate change. That, that problem is not going to be solved by a you can go hang attitude. Actually, to produce a sort of social change, the aid budget is going to be a crucial bargaining chip. Because I can totally, totally, totally understand somebody saying, well, your country belched out lots of CO2 when you were advancing. It's our turn now. And actually, part of our taking responsibility for finding another way has to involve sending some money in the other direction. Which could actually mean we have to think about the aid budget going up and not down. Thank you. Done. So, um, I'm going to be really, really honest. Um, we'll actually increase it from the current um, standard as it is at 0.0% uh, to 1% by 2021. Um, I think our position in the world is crucial at the moment, um, as I think many people have already said that our, our standing is, is, is so crucial because we've obviously got to get China to reduce their carbon emissions, to uh, decarbonise their industry in their country, um, but I think with foreign aid it, it is more a case of that we are a giving country, we always have been. Um, we've been a, a really given an open-armed country for so, so long. There are people across the world, and there are also corrupt governments across the world. Our government isn't perfect, so we can't really criticise those who have corrupt governments because it's not the people's fault. Yes, the people did vote for them, but then you get this kind of corruption going on in these, like in Afri Africa, for example, like Zimbabwe. You had this corrupt president for so long, which turned out to be amazing, and then look what happened, the country collapsed because of the former president, who obviously has, has now died. But, so, with the Green Party, we would invest it because it is so important what we do on how we help those who can't be helped from their own government. If it's not, we were, we're not the only country that gives to on, on foreign aid. There are hundreds. You've got America that gives to an extent, not under this president. Um, but you also got uh, Australia, New Zealand, France, Germany. They all give, but we would go a bit further. We would increase it. So that's pretty much who, what we would do. I'm being very honest. In the manifesto, we would increase that. We wouldn't decrease it because our partnership with everyone around the world is so important. Thank you. Shall I take another question? Just here.
is autistic, he's dyslexic, right. We were lucky. I lived in Whitton at the time, and the local primary school had a class set of town and gave good education to children with special educational needs. Unfortunately, Cambridge, although we've got some more money, is still one of the least, of the lowest financed counties in the country for school. And I'm sorry, I firmly believe in education, education, education. If we educate our children, then they'll be able to provide for their families in the future. And, and it, it, it goes on. If we don't educate them, then we have the problems where we have food banks, we have social problems, and there's a, there's a lot more to it. So education to me probably comes above a lot of other things that people want. I think you've got to start with children. Let's face it, my children are going to choose my girl eventually, so I want them to be well educated and be able to support me, as I have for, for my parents. Um, so, yes, I understand it. I mean, I was on the, the, the Children and Young People's Committee in, uh, in the County Council, and I know the problems we have this county. But unfortunately, as far as I'm concerned, successive governments haven't really grasped what's wrong out there and haven't done anything about it. But we should have, in mainstream education, all children. They need to mix, regardless of their needs, they need to get on with other children. But when they have special education needs and they have problems, we should cater for it. There's no reason why. A child is a child, in my view, and we give them what they want to educate. It's as simple as that. Thank you. I bring in Mark. So, can I just clarify, was that a question about special educational needs?
standard. So, <clears throat> as obviously, first of thank you for your question and for sharing your experience there. So, I, as a parent myself, I mean, I, I, I always like admire other parents, like, and, and you know, I, I think that you know, you're, I can just tell you, I can just tell you, you're doing an absolutely amazing job, and you know, people like me, and I don't know if, if growing up, if, if when they, you know, get involved with my children, are going to need this additional support. So, I would like to think that if they do, it will be there. And I know that a lot of people in your situation aren't <coughs> finding that at all. So. I agree with Mark to an extent, yes, this funding is important. We are in a position where school funding has been cut, particularly here in St. I mean, for example, the, between primary schools, it's between 300 to 400 pounds per child that has been a reduction in spending since 2015. For secondary schools, it's between 100 to 200 pounds per child in spending. Um, that's, that's one thing. But also what we need to be looking at as well is the way that, obviously, with most special education needs, that comes from the council who work in, in hand with the schools, but at the same time, they have also faced massive cuts. And it's and there's a current funding black hole nationwide for, for Senko of about 1.8 billion, I believe, and that's estimated by 2030 to get to about 6 billion, which is obviously a massive problem. So what we need to do is address it as early on as possible. Obviously, I understand your own personal situation, you were a bit further on down the line in terms of age, but we'll work along there. So, Firstly, what Labour proposes to do is to provide the support for parents uh, and children by reintroducing Sure Start into our country and reopening centres so that parents and children are adequately, adequately supported by their local authorities and the schools who they work with. Um, what we also want to do, and obviously everybody's education situation is different, what Labour also have pledged to do is found the National Education Service, which will provide cradle to grave free education from is from you know very young ages and six years of education for free if you get a bit older and you want to be retrained or to take on a new trade. So with that comes the investment and comes the additional support needed for people who are in your situation and your son's situation. Obviously he is unable to go to school at the minute. So what there needs to be is funding from the National Education Service to ensure that he's either supported in this home or safe environment or is able to move into a different environment. That's not, that's not right. We, can only, we, can, you know, we can't know unless we actually try. We need to put the investment into it. So for me, and what's been a big issue I think for a lot of parents, I mean I'm speaking from my own experience now, is that although my son has now just started his first year in school at reception, and his school has been, been open for less than three years, they're already having to collect money from parents. To, to fund activities and support for children in schools. And for me, again, and I, and, and I keep using this word because we're describing the last couple of years of conservative government, is an absolute disgrace. The fact that you are in your situation, excuse me, is an absolute disgrace in itself as well. So, as I said, what we need to do is make sure local councils are funded, to make sure our schools are funded, but also to make sure that there is an understanding in every single level of our community and also within our schools, so our children know how to support one another. And I know that's always pie in the sky, wishy washy thinking, but we do. We need to be teaching our children that not everybody is the same as them, that not everybody will grow up to be the same as them, that there are differences, and differences is what makes us great. But as a parent, and I'm sure, and I hope you agree with me, we have not been taken seriously. I, again, I, I pay massive tribute to you. Because I don't know if I, in a few years' time, will end up in a similar situation to you. And I can't imagine how hard that must be. So I think what we need to be doing is making sure that special education needs is fully funded, that we deal with it from an early age, but we need to obviously, we can't leave behind the people who are already facing this in terms of crisis. So we need to ensure that the tailored support, one-on-one, -on -one, from the council, from the schools, is available. And it's, it's not as simple as that, but it is. That's, that, that's the answer. That is the answer to this question. I think it's a very interesting point. I just want to stay with that for a moment because I wonder, is it possible to uh, separate the amount of funding that goes into school and what that funding is actually spent on? Because most schools are budget holders. And this is a question for any of you. 
Um, and to what extent do you think that the current Ofsted framework for um, testing schools puts such an emphasis on reducing every child to investigative heap of numbers that doesn't address the child as a person, but actually there is too much pressure on the schools and on teachers to achieve standards so that those who, for whatever reason, social or um, intellectual or whatever it might be, are not are finding it difficult to reach those standards, are actually not having the resources directly in their way. So, in, in answer to your question there, so, firstly, the support for special education needs tend to come up in funding streams towards the school, but also local councils are given a budget which they work in line with the schools and they will cover a certain area or district or city. That's the area of the council's responsibility. So there is money available for that, and unfortunately, in certain, and I, I, I currently work uh, in, in Peterborough, and we work closely with Peterborough City Council, and it's been unfortunate to see that in recent years, when they've needed to make budget cuts, this is the kind of thing that's always the first to go, and it is without unquestionably one of the most important things. You know, I mean, and then uh, secondly, um, I've actually forgotten the second point of your question. Um, <laughs> But ben, well, um, how do, do you think that the Oxford framework actually <laughs> discourages resources from being put into the so, Yes. And yes. I'm speaking as someone who's a school governor in this town. Um, okay, so yes is the answer to your question. I think that currently the way Ofsted works in regard to schools who have received an outstanding um, rating from Ofsted are exempt from from, from future inspections and, and you know rankings uh, is wrong. I, I don't think that even if a school achieves outstanding, I don't think that that should be here. You know. So what Labour proposed to do is to replace Ofsted with a system that is more fit for purpose, that will regularly ensure that schools are supporting those who are most in need, and that is something that I 100% support. And I think as well, uh, in regards to the other part of your question, is that we need to be looking at the way that children are, are assessed in that. So, also, I support the scrapping of the SAT exams, because I think that... <laughs> generally, based education is restricted, particularly if, if, if a child has additional needs. Um, and we need to be looking at their strong points and their strengths, and not what is going to be their weaknesses because of the restrictions of the system. Thank you. So having a this as well. How can it be that? You beat me to it. I'm so not happy. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, funny enough, so I'm going to come straight to your question and thank you for it because, wow. Um, yeah, it's, it's difficult. When you've got a really strong child that can't be integrated into the education system, it's such a knock effect, not just on yourself, but the child too, because they know they want to do education stuff, but they don't have the facilities available to them. And so, so what we would actually do is actually create a, an inclusive special needs in, uh, curricular educational system that's going to be beneficial to those uh, amazing and gifted kids, because that's what they are, they are amazing and gifted kids, because they don't get the support, the parents especially don't get the support, where they end up losing their job because the kids are skipping school, they're missing school, then the parents are going to get fired, take it to court. So it's this huge circle and it's totally demoralising and it's unfair. Why should you have to go through that when, if you any any other child that goes through the education system and goes to school easily, free, but those who have special needs, who are massively intelligent, you probably know more than I do. Um, but they suffer the most, and that's not fair. And exactly as Sam said, that we need to have a system that's going to be there for every single child, from pretty much cradle to grave, really. That you want that availability to you. Have, they can go to Open University. I can go to Open University and go and do a course. Amazing. Um, but, but we don't have that, and so we have to change the system. Um, as I keep saying, I like saying that, I'll change the system. But we need to change the system, it's, it's the matter of fact and it's the honest truth that we have to change the system for the better, for us, for us all. Um, now I'm going to answer your question in relation to um, Ofsted and SATs. Now, funny enough, 
sanding your teeth that part. So, but we're exactly the same. We would abolish Ofsted because it is, it's not fit for purpose, basically. I went really north of it, I don't know why. Um, it's not fit for purpose at all. It has to be replaced by a system that is going to uh, assess everything in a non-demoralising way for teachers. So, because it's, especially for schools, it's really demoralising. It, oh, you have to have not outstanding, or if, if, you, if you fail, then you're poor school. But it's not their fault, it's the government, because there's not enough money that's going into the educational system so kids can be taught adequately. Because we'll also reduce the amount of um, uh, school classes uh, matching the uh, So yeah, there's, there has to be a, a change, and also like uh, SAT exams too, we'll, we'll scrap them. Because I remember doing, I'm sure you remember doing this too, special like exams, when were, like, just before we went to secondary school. But, yeah, <laughs> and so we have those, and it's more a case to assess you on are you going to be okay, suitable going into education, uh, secondary educational, and that's not how it's supposed to be. It needs to be a way that kids can actually keep learning themselves. As I've already said before, teachers need to teach. That's what they're there for. That's their job. Thank you, Mark. Well, if I can just pick up the offset question. Um, Kind of is the recurring thing. We're talking about, from an endemic perspective, replacing Ofsted with something which places a higher emphasis on the child's well being. But I think the crucial point here is that when you start measuring it, you inevitably prioritise what you can measure. So if you've got a child who's not doing particularly well, and they'll drag your statistics down, but if you can get them out of the school, that's just helped your statistics. So you can create some quite perverse incentives there. Whereas if you change the system to measure things slightly differently, hopefully you can actually begin to get something which is a little bit more fit for purpose. But of course the sting in the tail of this one is that any changes to be incremental, because you throw out one system and replace it with something else and then discover a little bit too late what the problems with the new one are. But nevertheless, moving to thinking about well-being for the child in the school seems a better measure than the narrow one that Ofsted is using at the moment. Thank you. I am moving on. Uh, hand up, send on the players there. Do you not want me to open that one as well? Yeah. All right. Um, apologies if it's in trouble, but I'm not sorry. To me, one of the issues that feeds into all of the other things that we've done here tonight in terms of funding, uh, whether it's really distribution, whether it's a health service, etc., etc., et cetera, the, the large amounts of money that's been waking up, this issue of the UK in particular, also Europe, the rest of us. Incredibly low rates of increasing productivity. Most economists, most economists recognise this, and most people probably don't know about it. I'm interested that basically happens increasing productivity and increases the wealth of every society. That's what we're not really interested in. About. That's why we have enough wealth to have a national health service, to have social services, to have trains, etc., etc. But so this is still to spread the house in the night. So 2009, it was right before that. So what I'd like to establish in the candidates is A, that they recognise it's a problem, some element of understanding why it could be a problem, and if they can do it without mentioning industrial strategy or pre industrial revolution, what they would actually <coughs> do in terms of policy to try and address it. Thank you. Okay, well. I answer the last question first, if I may, uh, talking about funding for schools and offset. And that only goes you to be rather brief. Okay, okay, well, I was a county councillor when we changed the, the education system. Now, I firmly believe if it's not broken, don't try and fix it. And the formation of academies, in my opinion, was a retrograde step. When you had local government looking after local education, you could go to your county councillor and say, I have a problem at this school, and he would go back, or she would go back, and you at least have a, a chance of, of, of sorting it out. The problem with Ofsted is it's a national organisation. It's got no local thing. I am very much for local government for local people. And unfortunately, we've moved away from that. So I think we need to bring that back. Uh, at the moment, education, teachers, head teachers, are spending more time on worrying about and organising finances than they are on educating our children. 
So I will bring back the link between local government and local schools. I get the job step because we did the job far better in my opinion. Uh, I couldn't quite hear everything you said, sir, at the back, but I think it was to do with, with low productivity uh, and the fact that our GDP is rising slower than most of the world at the moment. And you're quite right, it is. In my opinion, one of the biggest problems we have is draconian EU rules that support big business who can pay for it, but make a mockery of small and medium enterprises who just can't do what they need to do to business. And that's one of the reasons I want to leave. Um, so I would say that's a problem. You know, there are 27 countries in the EU, and if you look at you know, people will say no, that's not true because there are different figures. But there are actually somewhere like 270 countries in the world. And in my opinion, is we should be trading with those we're an awful lot outside. And we were far better off, in my opinion, when we when we part of the Commonwealth and the rest of the world. I know you are all going to disagree, some of you are going to disagree, but that's that. Right. I've answered the question. Yeah, but we trade with the whole world under EU rules. And the EU trade rules are draconian. Okay? Now, it doesn't. I'm sorry, we would agree to disagree on that. Yeah, you know, I'm a businessman, I know. Also, you know, you look at a lot of things. I, when I was in the courts, the amount of Eastern Europeans who committed crime in this country, and I could not deport them. Before the EU, you know, and they kept on.
And I think one part of this is the long-term effects of that, which have cut a lot of the flesh, a lot of the fat off the system. But there is a much, much bigger story going on here, which is about the change in balance in world power. If you're China or India, and your people are coming out of enormous poverty, it's much easier to catch up than it is for a mature economy. That's why we have a major change in the global balance of power going on. It is almost inevitable that China with kind of 1.4 billion and India with 1.1 billion will become the world's major economies. Picking up the euro piece, just to put that into perspective, when the single market was created, the logic was that an individual European nation was struggling to compete with Japan or America because each was smaller, Japan with 1.1 billion. So, 110 million and the US with 170. Now, the combined population of Japan, the EU, and the US is still less than either China or India. That is a massive shift that's going on. So, what we're seeing, I think, is actually a decline of the West relative to the rest of the world. And that's the backdrop against which everything else is happening. The, the point about it being within the EU is it gives us the stability of that single market. And all these regulations, they're actually, things are going to need to be regulated, but if you actually have the same regulations across an entire single market, it does enough to make your trade easier. So that's a kind of going in the wrong direction to attack that. But the fundamental issue we're grappling with is a shift in balance of power. And for me, one of the really scary things about Brexit is that this is not the time to be detaching from a stable major block in the world because what will happen is glorious Brexit Britain will then become a medium-sized power, unable to resist the pressure of China or the US or in a few years' time of India. That's a very vulnerable place for us to be. But this is actually, and the scary part for the century is this is the century where the West has to navigate the loss of influence of the West in the world. And that is hard to get our minds around, but we need to do that. I'd like on your behalf to thank all the candidates, or those who turned up, uh, for being here tonight.